Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Docs Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events and this is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. So for me, actually the interface now on YouTube looks different. It changed today. I don't know how it looks for you, but I think if you just go below the video, you will see the link there. And I don't know how this button looks like for you, but if you see this button, and it says subscribe, please click on this. And this way you will subscribe to our YouTube channel and you will make sure uh, you will not miss any of our future events, which will be as amazing as this one. But I guess uh, for this one, the expectation is pretty high. So no pressure, please. And yeah, we also have an amazing Slack community. So check it out if you want to hang out with other data enthusiasts. And during today's presentation, you can ask any question you want. There is a link, a pinned link in the live chat. So just click on this link, ask your question, and we will be covering these questions after the presentation. So that's all from me. And now, Chris, uh, the, the floor is yours. So my name is Chris, or if you can pronounce Polish names, Krzysztof. Uh, I work for Zalando for the last five and a half years, and currently for the last two and a half years, I'm working in machine learning productivity team. I used to be an engineer in that team, and for the last half year, I'm a consultant, which means I work with other teams, other engineers, and uh, applied scientists to help them set up their production pipelines using Zalando infrastructure. Before that, also at Zalando, I was working on data governance topics such as GDPR and privacy. And before that, I was a game developer, and even before that, front-end engineer. So I've been doing software for quite some time. And in the last few years, I am focused on machine learning. And uh, I'm very excited to be invited here by Alexei to speak at uh, Data Docs Club. Thank you, Alexei, for having me. Uh, I hope that the rest Thanks of the for talk coming. Will go, I hope that the rest of the talk will go without any technical difficulties. So let's just go on with the talk. Machine learning is a journey. And I'm sure that uh, if you are listening to this talk, you probably embarked on some of these journeys yourself. What it means in practice is that there are different stages, different uh, parts of that journey that typically come down to this. So usually when you want to start a new machine learning project, you have some idea. At some point, you have to collect data for this project, process it. And this is the core topic of Data Talks Club. But uh, then you want to proceed and make it running. So first you experiment with your data, you test your hypothesis, and if you are happy with the result, you are ready to go to production. And finally, when it's in production, you can operate it, make profit, live happily ever after. In my talk, I would like to focus on two specific stages of the journey, experimentation and production. The gap between them, going from one to another, sometimes can be difficult. And um, there is a lot of different products, a lot of different approaches, how you can go from experimentation to production. In my talk today, I would like to show you how it's done at Zalando. Even at Zalando, it's not the only way to do things. I would, I would also want to show you how other companies and other tools are solving the same problems as uh, we are solving at Zalando. And hopefully, you will learn about um, different ways of crossing this gap between experimentation and production. So let's start with experimentation. What is experimentation? What do we need there? Well, it's something that allows you to code, to create uh, a way to test your hypothesis. For example, is this new business idea using data about your customer going to work in practice? And uh, because this is just for testing hypothesis, you want to be able to start quickly. You want to iterate fast. So you would like to receive uh, any warning signs, any problems as fast as possible. And you don't want to set up infrastructure for too long. You don't want to spend too much time on this. You would like to get results fast. You also will need some data because uh, it's 2022. Without data, your hypothesis is just a nice, piece of fiction. So you are probably familiar with a most common way to meet all these requirements and do your machine learning experiments. And this is Jupyter Notebooks. 
And at Zalando, we are not really reinventing the wheel. We are using Jupyter Notebooks as well. Our applied scientists and analysts are working with them every day. What we have on top of that is a custom installation of Jupyter Hub. At Zalando, we call it Data Lab because it's really a laboratory for the data. It's an open source product. Everyone can install it. And at Zalando, we have about 500 people who use it frequently mostly applied scientists and um, analysts. This allows you to very quickly within your browser in less than a minute start a new environment, which gives you all the features of Jupyter Notebooks, but on top of that also access to common data sources that uh, we have at Zalando. Sometimes what you get from Jupyter Notebook is not enough and you need high performance computing or HPC. In practice, it means uh, using some GPU, probably from NVIDIA. This is also something that we support for our users at Zalando. Um, and here, when I, mean, when I say users, I mean our internal developers and applied scientists. So internal users, not our customers. And the way to do it is um, multiple. So for example, we offer a custom uh, homegrown data center which is running open source software Slurm, where we have several NVIDIA high performance GPU cards. And these are accessible, for example, to our research teams who can use it to quickly iterate on large machine learning models. We also use cloud infrastructure from Amazon and uh, some of the GPUs that are available from Amazon are also available uh, to our users in Data Lab. So this way we solve a high performance computing use case for experimentation. In summary, we have two different ways, two different tools, Jupyter Hub, and uh, for special use cases, uh, we have our own data center with GPUs. So this was experimentation, but uh, production has uh, its own set of requirements that are quite different. So here you want to work with big data, which is not always the case in your experimentation. Big data in case of Zalando can mean uh, terabytes of data. We generate a lot of it uh, every day because uh, we have about 50 million active customers. It also means that uh, you should be able to scale up in terms of performance. Uh, so for example, if your experiment is successful, you would like to deploy it to production, you should be able to ensure that all the customers that need the service will be able to use it without much latency. And sometimes you need to scale it dynamically because you don't know upfront how many users you're going to serve. This is particularly important for retail companies such as Zalando on days such as uh, Cyber Friday or Cyber Week, because uh, the number of people using this service is dramatically higher in that period. There are also some requirements related to proper software engineering practices. For example, reproducibility. This means that whatever code you deploy to the production, you should be able to go back in time, look into it and see exactly what happened in the past. This is very useful when you need to debug some errors. So you should be able to reproduce anything that was ever deployed to production. It's 2022 and uh, GDPR or data protection regulation is in place. And it's not even under a discussion that you need to respect customer privacy. It's very important for the lander to earn and keep the trust of our customers so the data needs to be protected and this is also part of the compliance which means that you need to follow certain procedures before you get to production with your code one example of uh, such a procedure we have at zalando is 4i principle which means that every piece of code that is deployed to a live server needs to be approved by at least two people it could be one of these people can be an author of the code the other person is a reviewer, but two people always need to look at code that goes to production. And finally, security and access control is related to the previous two points. It means that the code that gets live needs to be uh, secured and only approved people can access it. So um, there is no uncontrolled access to it. And whoever uh, did something on production, you should be able to monitor it and track whoever and touch the code. So these are specific requirements requirements for production. And you can see that 
most of them are quite different and specific compared to experimentation requirements. So this is a bit of a background. And now I would like to talk with you about uh, some of the choices that we made at Zalando in terms of technology. And um, these are not choices set in stone. Things are changing. And what is very important is to understand that all the technology choices happen in a context. So let's start with this context. Zalando made a few years ago a strategic bet on AWS. So this is one of our constraints. So whatever we are deploying, we are building, is most likely going to deploy it, to be deployed on the AWS infrastructure. Uh, of course, AWS is not the only cloud provider these days. So there is also Microsoft Azure, there is Google Cloud Platform, but uh, at Zalando, we made this strategic bet on AWS. Also, we need to remember about our scale. So as I mentioned before, we have about 50 million active customers. And internally, we have uh, a couple of thousand people working technology that are organized in a few hundred tech teams. Uh, out of these few hundred tech teams, we have um, about 50 or more teams that are doing uh, machine learning. And uh, these teams are likely going to use the infrastructure that I described in this talk. So here the requirement is that we need to scale both in terms of our customer base, but also internally in terms of how things are organized in the company. And uh, another thing I would like to mention is that to respond to these needs, we now have a dedicated machine learning platform team, which started in 2019. And this is the time where we built the first version of the tools that I'm presenting to you before, uh, that I will present in a moment. I mentioned this last point and the date 2019, because um, when you see the choices we made, uh, some of the alternatives were not available at the time. So some of the things presented were first in a class, or at least there was no standard available. And um, we are pioneers in that regard. So this is the context. And uh, now let's look at the specific choices that we made at Zalando for building machine learning pipelines. I will start with something quite general with code management. And for this, we are using GitHub Enterprise. So you probably or very likely have used GitHub, either github.com, or if you work for a larger organization, probably you also use GitHub Enterprise. And this is managed ver version of GitHub. And it gives you some basics such as version control, collaboration features, for example, pull requests and code reviews. Um, but uh, also using GitHub, we implemented this compliance requirement I mentioned before, which is for ice principle. So we using GitHub, make sure that every piece of code that goes to production is reviewed by two people. Of course, this is not the only option on the market. There is, for example, GitLab, which is probably the most popular alternative. But at Zalando, we use GitHub Enterprise. Uh, we selected AWS as our cloud provider. It provides us uh, with cloud hosting, with storage services. And also, if you ever work with AWS, you know that they have this vast toolbox of different services for pretty much everything that is related to the web and also to machine learning. Specifically for machine learning, Amazon offers Amazon SageMaker which we are heavily using in our machine learning platform. This is not the only cloud provider out there. The most uh, important ones are Google and Microsoft. We are sticking with AWS. Big data processing is another fast growing field. And here our strategic bet is currently on Databricks, which is a platform that provides you managed Spark and it allows you to do both experimentation and big data processing using Spark. And there are also alternatives to that. Some of them are actually used in Zalando for specific purposes. For example, AWS comes with uh, some tools for big data processing, such as Redshift. There's also BigQuery from Google, Snowflake. And this is a very dynamic field, so I didn't even try to come up with all the possible alternatives here. And then, the essence, the 
probably most uh, interesting and important part of this talk, which is machine learning pipeline orchestration. This is going to be the main topic for today. And here, this is the first tool that we develop in-house. I would like to mention it, it's called Zflow. And it's a tool that is just a Python library offering domain-specific language or DSL for the purpose of describing your machine learning pipelines. And what you see on the right-hand side is actually a piece of code that is written using Zflow. Um, you don't have to analyze it, but what you should take from here is that it allows you to describe your machine learning pipeline, all the different stages of the pipeline in a very concise way. It's using AWS CDK or Cloud Development Kit. It's a tool from AWS that allows you to describe your infrastructure as code, again, in a quite concise way. And Zflow, you can think of it as an abstraction layer on top of CDK. What Zflow really does is that when you write your script, it will, after execution, generate a CloudFormation template. For those who have not worked with CloudFormation, you can think of it as an alternative to Terraform. It's a way to describe your infrastructure as code. And all the resources that will be needed by your machine learning pipeline, such as data processing, uh, training uh, tasks, um, permissions, roles, everything will be part of this CloudFormation template. And we also need an orchestration engine, so something that will actually execute our pipeline. And the tool we are using here is Amazon Step Functions or AWS Step Functions. Step Functions allows you to create a state machine, which is generated from a Zflow script. And after this state machine is deployed, it can be executed. Again, there are alternatives to all these pieces of technology that I presented. Quite popular one is Airflow, which allows you to describe your graph, uh, your pipeline. There are also dedicated tools for machine learning pipelines, such as MLflow, Kubeflow. Uh, recently, SageMaker also started to invest into that in the form of SageMaker pipelines. Here, I would like to note that not all of these tools were mature and present in 2019 when Zflow was already one of the very few available tools for us uh, to implement machine learning pipelines. You also need some form of continuous integration and continuous delivery or CI-CD. Here, there is another tool that is in-house that we developed at Zalando. There is a dedicated team to that. A uh, team for that, this is different team that, than ML Productivity, but I personally, I'm a huge fan of this tool. In fact, uh, I can say that um, if I ever leave Zalando, this will be one of the things I miss the most because uh, it's very nice to use. It's a UI and uh, a way to describe your deployment pipelines in a way that is quite easy to use and easy to debug. Uh, it's called Zalando CDP, and CDP stands for Continuous Delivery Platform. It comes with a UI, and this UI is built on top of Backstage. And Backstage is an open source tool for creating developer portals. Originally, it was created at Spotify, but Spotify a few years ago released it to the market uh, as open source. And uh, a couple of years ago at Zalando, we decided to, instead of reinventing the wheel, use Backstage and build our own developer portal on top of it. There are alternatives, again, for example, GitHub Actions. Uh, if you have been working with CI/CD long enough, probably you also work with Jenkins. And there is Team City, Circle CI, and many others. And the last part of uh, this uh, infrastructure overview that I would like to present is a way to keep track of your machine learning pipelines. By this, I mean observing how they are executed, compare individual runs or executions to each other, keep track of the models and keep track of the variables and uh, configuration values that change over time. Uh, for this, again, we use Backstage as a baseline and we created a custom plugin for it, uh, specifically for machine learning users. So CDP, which I mentioned before, is a plugin to Backstage and uh, our machine learning platform is also a plugin implemented on top of Backstage. Well, what it does, it provides custom UI 
that is project centric and uh, these projects are specific to machine learning so for example you can group together your experiments but also your production pipelines and have everything that your team does in one place in one project uh, we offer pipeline visual visualization so you can see the structure each step of the pipeline and uh, for example in the screenshot here you can also see individual executions and the variables that are generated from them and how they change over time this is not the only tool on the market especially in the last year or two a few were really moving forward and uh, develop interesting alternatives uh, i would here mention mlflow which is an open source product SageMaker Studio, there are also some commercial products. So that was a lot of, uh, this was a lot of uh, technology, a lot of tools. And now I would like to show you how in practice it looks to develop machine learning pipeline and put it in production at Zalando. So I showed you the specific choices that we made at Zalando. And now I will present how we use these uh, tools to create and deploy your machine learning pipeline. But let's start from the beginning. In the beginning, there is a structure, an idea, how your pipeline should look like. And very often there will be the same exact steps in any pipeline that you build, regardless of your problem. So for example, there will be some configuration management, there will be some data pre-processing state, data cleanup, there will be model training stage and finally inference, whether batch inference or online inference. So when you have this basic structure of your pipeline or pipeline design, you can start describing it as a script, as code. And for this, we use ZFlow, this um, DSL, which I presented before. Each pipeline implemented with ZFlow will consist of a pipeline builder, which is your overall skeleton, and individual stages. And uh, all these four stages that you can see on the left can be implemented as steps in ZFlow pipeline. And finally, there is a step for generating a file, an artifact, which will be a CloudFormation template. So in the middle, you have a pipeline implemented as a Python script. You execute the script, and as an outcome, you will have this infrastructure as code. So a cloud formation template describing all the resources needed to run your pipeline. This is code and code can be committed, pushed and uh, sent to GitHub Enterprise. This is where we review it. And once it's uh, there, it can be deployed to cloud. And uh, deployment is done by CDP, this continuous delivery platform that uh, is developed in-house and that I mentioned before. So this is automated step. Once your code is pushed by you to GitHub, it's taken there from there automatically by CDP, and then it's deployed to the cloud. We start with CloudFormation template as our main resource that is deployed. And uh, here AWS Cloud steps in. So what it does is using CloudFormation, it's creating all the resources that uh, form your machine learning pipeline. So I use this cloud icon and within it, you will find different icons representing different pieces of technology, different services that implement steps and parts of your pipeline. So for example, the green one on top represents cloud formation itself, which is the overall structure. And there is uh, step functions starting from the left, this um, yellow icon. And there are Lambda functions, there is SageMaker, but you can also call other services from your step function state machine that are not even in AWS, for example, Databricks. So the last logo that you see on the right, this red one, it's representing Databricks for data processing. So this is very important step. What happens here is all your resources are provisioned, are created in the cloud. When everything is there, when your pipeline is deployed, you can actually press the play button and execute it. Sometimes it's literally pressing a play button. You can do it, for example, from AWS console. But of course, this is infrastructure as code, so you can also execute it programmatically. And uh, you can do it using a scheduler, uh, which is the most typical way to do it. You can also do it in response to some triggers. So for example, whenever, whenever there is a new piece of data, you can automatically run your pipeline or execute it. 
Once the pipeline is running, it will generate a lot of events. We track these events and save them in a custom database that we built for this purpose. And this database contains the structure of your pipeline, each individual step, and all the events that happen during execution. This is especially useful during debugging because whenever there was an error, whenever you have a stack trace, it will be saved in that database. And once you have it in a database, of course, you can visualize it. And for this, we use this ML platform plugin built on top of Backstage. And this is the end of our journey of ML pipeline. I know it's a bit complicated, so maybe let's take a look at this and uh, see it all together. So it starts with a concept of a pipeline, which is then implemented as a Zflow script. That script generates infrastructure as code in the form of CloudFormation template, which we commit to GitHub. We review it. Then it's automatically deployed to the cloud, where all the resources that are described in your template are provisioned. And once it's in the cloud, you can execute it either manually or programmatically. And then you can keep track of the execution. You can see it in a UI. So this is a story of a ML pipeline journey. This is something that we already have in place, but uh, we also have active team that is working on improving the platform. So some of the things that the team is working on right now is reducing this process complexity and uh, specifically something that we call lead time. Lead time is the time from the beginning uh, of our journey, from the idea until you have a working product in production. So of course, you don't want to waste time here and eliminate any efficiencies. Uh, we also want to focus more on observability to make it easier to debug our pipelines to trace things such as model drift and have better insight into pipeline execution. This is something that the team is currently working on. And this is more or less the end of this talk. I would like to summarize what we learned today. So experimentation and production are two important phases of a machine learning journey, and they have specific requirements. Starting from experimentation, you want to focus on speed and quick iteration. Uh, you also need access to uh, some specific resources, such as GPU for experimentation. And uh, there are tools that we have in place for that, such as Jupyter Hub and high performance computing, um, both in the form of our own data center and also available from the cloud. When it comes to production requirements, what is the key requirement is scalability, which also comes uh, with performance, like with experimentation, but it's like it takes a different form because it has to scale to millions of users. And we also have compliance and regular, regulatory expectations in place and that are related to privacy, to security. Here, the tools we are using are multiple. Uh, everything is running on top of AWS. And we also have our own custom tooling in form of Zflow and continuous delivery platform. I would also want you to remember that this is just one way of doing things. Uh, we are quite happy with this. At Zalando, we have over 30 teams that are using this approach and deploy their machine learning pipelines in production using Zflow. But uh, of course, when you work in a different company, you have other options that I presented before. And uh, sometimes having too much choice is a bit of a hassle. And especially now, because this field is rapidly evolving, it could be a bit difficult to choose what works best for you. I would encourage you that if you make such choices, you should from time to time look around on the market, what has changed and maybe reevaluate them and uh, make a decision whether it's worth switching or maybe sometimes it's more efficient to double down on what you have and implement exactly what you need that will allow you to move faster than your competition. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is the way to find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I would also encourage you to visit our engineering blog at Zalando at uh, engineering.zalando.com. There is a longer version of this talk in a form of article that describes in more detail how it works, uh, how machine learning pipelines work at Zalando and how we implemented Zflow. And if you are interested in data and machine learning, 
We also have some job openings. So if you visit our jobs page at jobszalando.com and search for ML or machine learning, you will find something that could be interesting to you. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, thanks a lot for a presentation, for a great presentation. So that we have quite a few questions already, but I wanted to ask something. If you can go to uh, slide 27, where you have the overview of all the... Uh, this one? This one, yeah. So I'm wondering, um, do you do this per each project? So do you generate this uh, Zflow uh, file and then CloudFormation in each project separately, or you have like one central repo where you have all these configs? Uh, yes, so at Zalando, every team has their own repo for their own projects. And uh, in fact, every project has a separate repository. So if you are one team, probably you have more than one repo and every pipeline is a separate thing. Mm -hmm. So they are level. stored, all the configs, all the cloud formation configs stored independently in each project. Yes, right? and so this is necessary to scale because at Zalando we have a um, few hundred teams, so we want to also reduce the number mm -hmm. of dependencies between the teams. Mm -hmm. So then you have a few hundred uh, cloud formation stacks in your cloud, right? Um, so not all of these few hundred teams are using Zflow because not mm. all, all of them are using machine learning, but we have at least 30 teams that are using Zflow. 30 and, teams. Uh, there is definitely more than 30 cloud formation stacks. Mm -hmm. sure. 30 teams. So I'm, I'm just wondering how many models do you actually have? Like I, I assume that each team has at least one model, but usually it doesn't stop at one, right? So the, you, a team might have five, 10 use cases that are powered by machine learning. Do, do you have a number? Uh, currently, I don't, uh, but uh, rec quite recently we implemented model registry. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't track like an overview uh, in one place, but uh, yeah, we have this number in the database. I just don't know it on top of my head. Mm -hmm. Um, just uh, I know that in our tech blog at Elix where I work, we have an article that uh, summarizes the major use cases of machine learning in our company. I'm wondering if there is something like that uh, in Zalando blog. Uh, so it's not on the blog, but uh, recently my colleague um, Stephanie, she gave a talk exactly about this. And uh, as far as I know, there will be an article that will be released soon okay. uh, on that. Uh, maybe it will also make it to Zalando Engineering Block, but just to give you idea what we are using machine learning at Zalando for. Uh, so when you open Zalando, you want to shop for clothes. One of the first things you will see is a homepage which already gives you some recommendations that are personalized. So using the past sales data both from about you, but also other customers, we can give you recommendations. So recommendations is one use case for machine learning. Search is another one. And then we also give you recommendations for outfits, like what things can be uh, going well together. Like for example, some shirts, trousers, and uh, let's say shoes. Um, this is something that we are also investigating how we can um, use machine learning to generate these. Uh, also for uh, things like predicting sales data, uh, like how many items we need to order, how much volume we will have. This is another use case. So machine learning is really used in many, many different places at Zalando. And uh, I'm just checking right now in our channel, in Data Talks Club, Club channel, we it's actually a third, if I'm not mistaken, a third talk from Zalando. So there was one about uh, uh, size, uh, like, well, fit estimation Size like how fit. yeah exactly um like it's a talk about how zalando uses deep learning for that and then another one is from my ex-colleague hagop who is working now uh, in zalando it's about uh, probabilistic uh, forecasting so quite yes. interesting talks so actually i can say that uh, both of these in size and fit and forecasting and they're using that <laughs> okay okay i'll uh, if you don't mind i'll share my screen with questions so i will stop sharing yep so and actually i was checking this backstage it's a really cool thing uh like i didn't know that uh, you can do so many things with this but yeah so the questions we have and it's actually i have a related one i wanted to ask you too about that 
So why did you decide to go with step functions? Why not something else for Z4? Yes, so this is a very common question. Uh, so here I would say one of the arguments was timing. So uh, some of the tools uh, that are available now were not available in 2018 and 2019 when we developed Zflow. That's one argument. Uh, secondly, it's uh, a bit of a historical artifact, uh, and it's related to the problem we're trying to solve. Because before Zflow, what was happening is that people were writing these cloud formation templates by hand. And if you have ever done it, you know that it's a very painful and error-prone process. So Zflow started as a nicer way to provision your infrastructure, to implement infrastructure as code. And uh, later it turned out that it actually is doing a lot of other things very nicely. And because we have it in-house, we can integrate with uh, our internal tooling, for example, with CDP, uh, we can faster respond to customer needs. So right now we are actually using Airflow at Zalando, but uh, mostly for general purpose ETL tasks. And for machine learning related projects, we focus on Zflow and we implement features that are required specifically for these purposes. And um, I haven't used step functions a lot, but from what I know, they are like serverless. It means that you don't need to maintain a cluster uh, for for scheduling these things. While for Airflow, you actually need to pay for the compute for the machines where Airflow is running. And uh, it's not like uh, at the scale of a company, maybe the cost is not that much, but this is something you can also keep in mind, right? So because like these things are serverless, but for Airflow, you actually need servers. So when you have a step function state machine, so for example, um, if you remember this graph showing your state machine, what is most cost costly is in individual stages. So for example, if you call Databricks for data processing, uh, you run Spark cluster and this costs money. Uh, but uh, step functions itself, it's actually very cheap. So you still need to pay for execution of the state machine, but it's very light and very cheap. Most of the cost comes from individual stages and that depends on what the stage is doing. For example, is it model training in SageMaker, which could be on GPU, that could be expensive, mm -hmm. or in Databricks uh, when you run Spark cluster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a similar tool. Uh... At Elix, but we decided to have a wrapper around Airflow, not a wrapper about uh, step functions. Well, I don't know the, the story behind this by Airflow specifically, but yeah, that's, I guess, uh, many companies a few years ago um, needed to implement something like that. It can be done in Airflow. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. So is it open source? No. So actually, when you Google Zflow, or if you search on pypy.org, you will find it, um, but um, generally not. So um, we only provide wrapper for our internal users to make it convenient to install uh, Zflow internally, but uh, we did not release the open source mm -hmm. code. So what happens if I do pip install Zflow? It will not work because you don't have access to the code. And uh, it doesn't mean that we are not open to open sourcing it. Um, but uh, for this, there would need to be like proper demand, uh, proper need from um, potential users. So it's not open source. Yeah, but if, if someone is really fascinated by the concept, uh, please reach out to me. Um, maybe there is interest. Uh, it could be open source in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, what kind of problems with connecting all that tools without a uh... AWS, what's the most, I, I think there are two kind of questions, right? So the first one, what, what kind of problems do you have when you connect all these different tools? Uh, so this is something that uh, is one of the reasons we created Zflow. So for example, Databricks and uh, SageMaker, there are two different products from two different companies. But with Zflow pipeline, you can have a single pipeline that is quite seamlessly integrating both of them. So you still need to take care of things such as authentication. And Zflow, again, is providing you some helpers for that. Um, but a lot of this complexity of integrating two different worlds is removed. And uh, Zflow makes it easier. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm not so sure about this part without AWS because, like for example, for AWS, I assume if you, since you use AWS, you would store all the artifacts, all the data in S3, right? And then both your SageMaker uh, jobs and Databricks cluster have access to this S3 buckets, right? And then this is how you the point of integration, right, through these buckets. Yes, and uh, actually, it's exactly how it works in Zetflow. So very often you have Databricks job that is writing to some S3 bucket, and then you have a SageMaker training job that is reading from there. Mm-hmm. And what's the most important uh, thing to do after the data is cleaned? Um, I'm not sure what was the intent here um, with this question, but uh, when the data is cleaned, when you have your model, you just want to execute it and see the results. And uh, in practice, I can tell you that uh, sometimes there is some debugging needed before the pipeline is ready. And uh, this is the reason and the motivation why we created these observability tools, these custom UIs. So I would say, uh, at least from like engineering point of view, um, just getting the whole thing running end to end is sometimes a challenge because uh, especially when you have a large scale, when you have uh, security requirements, requirements, permissions, resolving all of that and making sure that everything works end to end, this is sometimes a challenge. Mm-hmm. Once it works, it's reproducible and it just goes automatically. Um, thinking of this reproducibility, uh, is there a way to do things locally with Zflow before you actually publish them? before you create this cloud formation template, before you like orchestrate the whole thing? So actually the first step, which is uh, writing this pipeline and generating cloud formation template currently happens locally on your local machine. Mm -hmm. So you write this script on your laptop, you run Zflow locally and you get the script and then you push it to Git. Mm -hmm. But uh, because it's in the end, something that needs to run using uh, step functions in the cloud, you cannot run the whole thing locally. Because mm-hmm. so just... <laughs> yeah, you mentioned it's uh, like you need to make sure that the thing runs end to end locally. And usually the easiest way to make sure that it actually happens is to try to run those all these individual steps locally somehow, and then make sure that, okay, like it can actually process this data like on a small sample, and then you deploy this to the cloud. So this is, not actually this is not even going to happen because in fact we are even moving into being more in the cloud okay okay so, so um for well, example, if it works for you and then uh for example we would like to move even some of this initial step of generating the template to the cloud so mm-hmm. everything is cloud first mm-hmm. and your data scientists do they even need to like i guess you mentioned jupiter hub or jupiter lab mm-hmm. uh so in principle, they probably don't need to do much stuff on their local machine, right? So everything they need is already in the cloud? Yes, uh, that's the purpose we build data lab. So um, if you work with Python, you know how painful it is to set up environment dependencies. You have to deal with different tools for that. And in data lab, first, it's batteries included. So you have all the common things installed. In fact, you can even work with Zflow from data lab. So if you don't want to install Zflow locally, you can just do it from a um, mm-hmm. instance in Data Lab. And um, yes, we definitely want to move this to the cloud as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So does it mean that if I'm a data scientist working at Zalanda, all I need to work is a browser? I don't know if there's someone like that who is brave enough, but. <laughs> uh, it's a very good challenge. I wouldn't be surprised if it's possible. Mm-hmm. I've uh, heard that people at Google do that sometimes. If not today, I wouldn't be surprised if that will happen a few years from now. But uh, okay. um, I can tell you that, for example, with Zflow, which was built initially with your local machine in mind, uh, sometimes people just do it in Data Lab, so from the browser. Um, so we are running a course in Data Docs Club, and from what I see, getting the environment correct, right, the right way, making sure that all the dependencies are there across all possible hardware and software, like in Windows 10, Windows 8, I don't know what else, like all the Windows, and make sure that the content we prepared actually works on every single machine, is really a big challenge. 
So imagine that moving to the browser where the environment is already prepared, already set, makes this part easier, like this environment management. Yes, definitely. Okay, question from Murali. How do you monitor control the cost of the de development, particularly when the majority of uh, dev and test run cycles uh, run, run on expensive hardware on the cloud? Do you have yes. any best practices? Yes, so this is a very important topic, cost uh, control and cost attribution. So the first step is that um, these teams that I mentioned before that are using ZFlow, they usually have their own separate AWS account. So this way, everything is wrapped within the account and that team can see how much money they spent. And AWS has actually very good cost reporting. And so you can see breakdown by each individual service within the account. Um, we also, just to make things easier for some inexpensive things, for example, data lab. And this is something that we centralize. So there is one team, my team, which operates data lab. And if you don't use GPUs, you don't have to worry about uh, like the cost of running an open. It's only when you use something more expensive like GPUs, then that we have to uh, set up these GPUs to belong to your account. And then you have to pay for it from your AWS account. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then that's another advantage of using step functions, right? So because you have this cloud formation template and you deploy it in some account, right? And for yes. you, as somebody who is maintaining this uh, Z flow, you don't care which account it is, right? Exactly. So, so this is their, uh, not problem, but like maybe a responsibility, right? To make sure that uh, they don't accidentally create like a super huge machine. If they do, they will deploy it in their own account and yeah. uh, the cost is attributed there. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And uh, yeah, you have you still have a centralized a central place, which is this uh, hub, right? Um, yeah. So Zflow itself is developed uh, centrally, and also some of the tools like Jupyter Hub is managed centrally. And this is uh, free for others to use. Mm -hmm. And who is responsible for writing these Zflow scripts? Uh, this yes, that's this? Uh, actually a very interesting question as well. So we don't say that it must be, for example, software engineers or ML ops engineers, or only data scientists. Everyone who is interested in getting their code to production can do it. So I personally run Zflow trainings within the company, and uh, I can tell you that we have more or less equal split of software engineers and data scientists who attend this training. So both of them can do it. Um, I think that sometimes it's a bit easier for software engineers or ML ops engineers if uh, things go non-standard way or more complicated to debug all this AWS complexity. But uh, very often it's not a problem because uh, especially for simple pipelines, this complexity is abstracted away by Zflow. So you don't have to know that there is cloud formation, there is step functions and so on. It's hidden away from you. So definitely our data scientists are capable of doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned MLOps engineers. Is it a thing? Like, do you have MLOps engineers as a separate role at Zalanda? Um, so currently we don't have like a specific name, role description or track for MLOps like research engineer for you or um, what's the name? Um, so I use this name more or less unofficially. So for example, mm. people who are in my team, what we in, do in practice is ML ops very often, but uh, my title official as an under senior software engineer, it's not mm -hmm. uh, ML ops engineer. Mm -hmm. okay. But if you were to hire a person like that, uh, how would you, you would put like a senior software engineer in the title or how would you name it? I would just say software engineer. Um, and then describe and inside. Like for example, recently to uh, one of our sub teams, to experimentation teams, we hired a few great people that were just straight out of university. So they had background in software engineering and data scientists, and they were able to quite quickly get on board and contribute. Um, if you need someone more senior than someone who already has done it, like deployed machine learning pipelines using Airflow or work with AWS, this is definitely helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the reason I'm asking is recently in our Slack, we had a question about like, okay, I'm looking for MLOps engineering jobs, but I don't, I cannot find many. 
And I, I think the reason this person cannot find many is because it's not really a thing yet, at least. Like you don't come across many MLOps engineers. Usually they go by different names like machine learning engineers, software engineers, research engineers, just engineers, data engineers, any sorts of engineers, right? Yes. So right now we just hire software engineers. Uh, also at Zalando, we prefer people who can be full stack um, and uh, are flexible. Even I change roles and teams at least three times at Zalando, and I started doing something completely different. So flexibility and ability to learn new things, I think, is more important than some specialization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what type of projects do you have within computer vision area? Uh, so this is uh, less of my speciality, but I know that, for example, the team that was mentioned today, size and fit, and they're using computer vision. So the way it works is that uh, you can um, take a picture of yourself and then we'll give you a recommendation for perfect size of, let's say, shirt, trousers, dress uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, we had a talk from your colleague, Noor. Mm -hmm. AI in fashion, size and fit. Yes. So, and she goes into quite a lot of details how exactly the model works or worked 10 years, uh, 10 months ago. Sorry. So, I don't think it's changed significantly, but uh, I don't know. Uh, so, actually, this is like active field uh, of research and development at Zalando. So, uh, it's possible it that things right. have changed, but uh, the area is definitely of our interest. Another one is generating outfits programmatically. It's also something that we investigate. Yeah, that was actually like, uh, I was really curious to, about that. Uh, so like if you were starting from scratch, what which stack would you go with? Would you still implement something like ZFlow or? Uh, so I actually anticipated this question and I thought how, how I would answer it. And to me, this is uh, really a science fiction kind of question. So it's a bit difficult to say because it depends which variables would change. For example, what didn't change is that we are still on AWS. Um, back then there was already SageMaker from AWS in 2019, but right now it's more mature. But even now it still doesn't have everything that we need. So there are some requirements uh, that are just unlikely to come from AWS, for example, deeper integration with Databricks. So it's very difficult for me to answer. I know that there was also a lot of progress. For example, uh, three years ago, there were no MLflow pipelines. So MLflow was much less mature product than this right now. Uh, Kubeflow also is developing very fast. It's hard to say, but uh, mm -hmm. right now, we are quite happy with ZFlow and uh, we are able to do things that are not possible or would take much more time to get from open source tools or other commercial tools. I st still need to try MLflow pipelines. If, ever since the announcement, I wanted to try this, but just didn't have a chance to. Like, it looks promising and I've been an MLflow user for quite a while. And uh, yeah, it was quite a recent announcement. Um, so I'm really curious how it actually works in practice. One thing, of course, is reading a blog post about this, and then other thing is actually trying this. So it's not unlikely that uh, you would end up having some sort of that flow variant if you start from scratch again. It's totally possible. And for example, when it comes to MLflow specifically, we actually embrace it recently for experimentation. So to track our experiments, we enable MLflow. Yeah, the, quite an interesting question. So do you automate model retraining process? And what are the challenges in this process if you do? Uh, so here I can tell you a bit less about because uh, this is something that specific teams implement. But uh, you can implement this using um, ZFlow pipelines. Also, I didn't mention this, but uh, uh, these ZFlow pipelines, they allow you for quite flexibility. So for example, you can have branching. So you can have, I know that we have real pipelines that, for example, uh, do different processing for every country where we operate. And then you can train model models in parallel. In parallel. We also have some infrastructure for A-B testing that is developed by a completely different team. And uh, here you can also compare performance of your different models. Um, so we have some things in place, 
but uh, I will not tell you too much about the specific challenges because this is something that uh, individual teams that are using ZFlow uh, are facing. And it's uh, like for some for some cases, it just doesn't make sense to invest in time into this, right? But for some cases, it makes a lot of sense, like recommenders. I think for recommenders, you have something like that in place. Okay. What do you expect to see uh, for an entry level person uh, at Zalanda for a machine learning role? Um, that's a very good one. So recently we were hiring uh, a few people like that for my team and um, we wanted uh, people to have some at least basic background in data science. So ability to use um, Python libraries for um, data science, uh, ability to or experience working with Jupyter notebooks. Uh, if you did, for example, some Kaggle challenges before and you are familiar with that, uh, I think it's a good start for entry level. Uh, you will score definitely extra points if you work with uh, cloud infrastructure for ML from ideally AWS, but uh, if you work with Azure or GCP, that will also be um, a good sign. So two important things in terms of hard technical skills is uh, some background in data science and Python programming, and then some experience with uh, cloud providers. Do you care if a person knows SQL well, or it's not something your team needs to, to use very often? So for example, in the interviews for junior roles, we didn't check for SQL specifically, but I can tell you that um, it is useful. It definitely helps. Uh, if you know some SQL, uh, but I think if you work in tech at some point, you will have to learn it. Yeah, of course, <laughs> but uh, yeah, of course you will have to, but the question is if it's like something you check, but you answer that it's um, not. We didn't check it in the interviews, yeah. but uh, for example, in my role, I had to use some of these basic SQL a couple mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. So what do machine learning engineers do at Zalanda? Or like in your case, I guess it's software engineers who have to do with uh, who have to to use machine learning, right? You don't have ML engineers as a title. Do you? Uh, we don't have it as a title, so it really depends on the team. So my team is a bit special because we build infrastructure, so it's uh, less important for people in my team to be experts in data science itself. Uh, but the product teams and people who work there they need to be stronger in that. What we do in my team is more straightforward software engineering. And uh, when it comes to typical tasks, again, that depends on the team. So in our team, we make sure that the services around it work. I personally spent a lot of time going through different AWS services and debugging them. Uh, I think, especially now, since I switched from engineering to consulting, this is probably the biggest. Uh, the most frequent task I do. But if you are actually a ZFlow user, then you have to understand data science, you have to know how to glue things together. Definitely you need to understand uh, how API work and um, how to build a service to deploy your model so it can handle user requests. Yeah, I interviewed with Zalando like four years ago. Maybe this is not super actual, but I remember so one interview round, I was grilled for all these theoretical questions about data science. Okay, like what's the difference between random forest and XGBoost? And then for another round, it was uh, I was doing whiteboard coding with Java. So that's that felt pretty hardcore to me, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, uh, maybe now you're. Doing, on the role. Yeah, yeah. So like the, each team has its own specific requirements, right? Do you have uh, maybe one more minute to answer? Yeah, sure. I have more time. Okay, so what do you think about this one? Do you can you also use other languages for Zflow? Is that um, well, a computer scientist answer to that would be if um, you use Turing complete language, then of course you can. <laughs> um, so, but we are not using it, uh, not using these languages for that purpose. Mm -hmm. I know that some notebooks, uh, especially in Databricks uh, are using Scala and even I myself uh, wrote some of them in Scala. I don't know if anyone is using TypeScript for that purpose. It is possible. It's just because Python is so popular in the whole data science world. So basically all our internal users, they are familiar with Python. That's why it just makes more sense to use Python. 
Okay, maybe let's take this last one. So can you express arbitrary directed acyclic graphs in Zflow and does it support cron-like scheduling? So um, yes and yes, that's the short answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then I guess uh, we don't need to go into details, right? Uh, I can uh, give you more details, but uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, but since it's not open, not open source, uh, yeah, please think about open sourcing it. I think many people will find it useful. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Chris, for joining us today, for sharing your experience, um, for telling us how you do things, and thanks everyone also for joining us today, for being active, for asking questions, and. Uh, uh, maybe last one. Uh, I think you showed it. Like, if somebody has questions to you, then you had a slide with your LinkedIn and Twitter, right? That's the yes. best way to contact you. Yes, absolutely. And I will be happy to answer questions. And also, if you are interested in working with us, jobszalando.com. <laughs> please visit that page. Okay. Yeah, because and, we. Yeah, sorry, please. Uh, no, just wanted to thank you a lot for inviting me, and it was really fun to present here. And thank you, everyone who asked questions. They were really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, yeah, of course, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, really glad to have you here. We had quite a few questions that we left without answers. Apologies for that, but you know how to find Chris. So if you really want to know the answer, yeah, you can find him. OK, thanks, everyone. Thank you, and have a great evening. Bye.